Thank you. We'll call the July 23rd, 2020 Finance and Personnel Committee meeting to order. We have all of our members present. Doug, would you like to note that we'll be discussing the matter that you want to bring? Yeah, to but it, um, we just got a letter out about the corridor connector and the local contribution, so I'd like to be able to bring that up on the outstanding issues if we could. Duly noted, so we'll turn that over to you when we get to that portion of the agenda. Next order of business is the adoption of our May 28, 2020 meeting minutes. You've had this agenda for a few days now. Is there any, is there a motion to approve, a motion to amend? Motion to approve as presented. Second. <clears throat> All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right, our next matter annually we elect officers of the Finance and Personnel Committee, beginning with, who, who are, I guess it goes, chair, vice chair, secretary. Do, Correct. Do we, do we need secretary, treasurer of the f and I think the, um, I guess as long as they're- I don't know if this is bylaws, but they don't talk about the f and yeah. so. Yeah. I think we ma we've matched what the authority board has. I think uh, the chair has signed the minutes, so. I will, if you wanted to, I was going to say just put the county administrator spot there for that for Warren and whether that's Mr. Daly, who has joined us here today as the interim or the eventual, my successor, that person could slide in that slot, but it's up to, I'll leave it up to the, your thoughts. Historically, the, the board chair, the authority board chair created the FNP Correct. as a, a facilitator for, just suggests, finance and personnel related matters. Well, um, is there a preference on office, officers? And can we make it one motion? Can we? No, maybe not. Gary, is it your preference not to have that position? I'm just not sure what the position does. Well, so, sometimes committee. you have to sign documents. Granted, that's for the authority board, yeah. not here. I mean, I serve as the secretary yeah. right now for the authority board. Um, if you did a bond deal, you'd have to sign. For the authority board, but not here. for the committee. So let me do this. I'll just I'll make a motion that we appoint Mr. Bass as chair, and Mr. Curry as vice chair for the upcoming year. As the officers. Gary? Of course I'll second that. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> All right, we have a motion and a second, uh, basically keeping the same slate we currently have, with the exception of the Secretary Treasurer remaining vacant for the foreseeable future. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right. There you have it, Russ. Everything's in good order now. <laughs> Superintendent's report. Sure. Um, Average daily population for June, Rappahannock with 10 at 3.7 percent, Shenandoah with 138 at 52.1 percent, and Warren with 117 at 44.2 percent, bringing the total member jurisdiction ADP to 265. Um, currently we have Page County with 33 contract beds and Culpeper with 58, bringing the total facility ADP to 356. Um, as an update, as far as our contract beds, um, we are starting to see those increase a little bit. I've had some requests in the last few weeks, so we're actually at 37 with Page as of today and 70 with Culpepper. Um, right now, that's probably going to take us to about our capacity that we can deal with now as far as where we're at with staffing. Um, maybe one or two more here and there. If the state would um, start taking uh, they're responsible inmates at some point. That would definitely help us out. I think we're sitting at 42 out of compliance um, for Department of Corrections. So if one, when and if they ever start taking their responsible inmates again, that could definitely free up some space that we could rent some more space out. That number was what, 42? 42 out of compliance as of this morning. And we keep that running stat on your monthly statistics that we have uh, in the sheet as well, so. Usually it's down about half that on an average, um, you know, but since COVID they've stopped taking people and that's just driving that number up. Um, currently we have 13 inmates on home electronic monitoring um, vacancies. Um, we have 38 officer vacancies. This d does include the eight positions held for savings. Now 12. 
12 business proceedings now. Oh, sorry. 12. <laughs> Thank Sorry, you. sir. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, uh, let's see. We have one officer candidate background, and we had two scheduled for interview. We actually interviewed them yesterday. Um, they will not be moving forward uh, in the process. So this, you know, obviously um, COVID has a lot of impacts, including folks that work in the facility who may be apprehensive about working in the closed environment. Do you think that's hurting our ability to recruit folks? Uh, well, th two, two things, COVID, well, actually three things. COVID, um, just kind of the bad press, the public safety, specifically law enforcement's getting out there and um, I think it's probably hurting us. And then the unemployment um, uptick of the $600 on top of your normal unemployment uh, definitely has hurt applications. I think not just for us, but for everybody. Um, so I'm hoping we'll see a change here soon since that money potentially may be drying up, but you know, I just think there's just a lot of things working against us to try to you know, get applications in. Um, but. Uh, Mr. Chair, I ask Brendan. Brendan, are you seeing that at your other jails that y'all represent? change in the, uh, the you know, unemployment benefits that, that may give you a little bit of an uptick. Sure. You know, and with no job fairs happening, nothing like that's happening where we can go out and try to recruit people. That's making it difficult as well. We're receiving interest through Indeed where we advertise. That's our biggest really pool that we're pulling from. But we're seeing a lot of people that are just putting in for jobs to put in for jobs to maintain that status that they have to for unemployment. Um, they really just don't have an interest once we do reach out to them, or you can kind of tell just by how they've applied. Um, hopefully we'll see a change in that, though. Um, we, have, we have had nine officers resign um, in, in the midst of COVID-19, you know, because they have concerns over COVID-19. That's what they stated in their exit interviews. Um, I had one this week that um, it's one of the officers has been with me since the beginning, and unfortunately she is going to have to resign her position because she's going to have to stay at home to homeschool her kids you know with the school year modifications that are having to be made because of COVID so I don't know if I'll have more of those as, as we get closer to the school year or not we'll just have to wait and see but uh, you know it's uh, unfortunate you know that people are having to make some of these decisions that they feel are best for their families at this time that's looking at the chart that's prepared that's my concern is that the separations have accelerated as of late and I don't think we can handle too many months of what you've endured or over the last month or so. Fortunate, you know, I guess one of the, the fortunate things that we've been able to shut down our work release program, which doing so has been able to get me to bring staff back into the confinement side. So that's, that's helped me. You know, if we didn't have that, if we still had work release occurring, we would definitely be in worse shape. We would, we would not be able to, you know, rent these bed spaces like we do and things like that. So. You know, we'll hopefully we can maintain where we're at and hopefully pick some people up. But you know, it, we'll see how that trajectory keeps moving if it's going to be up or down. Is there anything we need to do if it doesn't? If the trend continues to be worrisome and we're shorter staffed, are we going to have to start saying notice to pay call pepper to come pick up the people? We we would, and and the, you know, I'm in you know almost weekly conversations with both of those um, jurisdictions and they, they understand they know where we're at they're kind of in the same boat you know it's they they understand where we're at and they know that that could happen at any time and you know, they just have to 
you know, work through it. You know, in both of our agreements, you know, it's kind of a 30 day notice thing, you know, which we, if we saw it heading that way, you know, we would, you know, give those notices if we need to. But, you know, right now we're, we're not there yet, fortunately. Um, like I said, it would really help us if the state would start taking some of their responsible inmates that would free up, you know, quite a few beds. Um, I know you guys, we put, we put on hold the salary increase to start <coughs> you know, discussion and get into a little bit further, but there's not many things you have in your toolbox that you can do in trying to be competitive from the job market. One, um, working with the state and then handling our, our outside bed rentals. You, know, you can't control how many inmates are brought in from localities, um, much of that, or how long the sentences are, much of that's outside of our hands. But um, work on the things you can uh, address. But um, I, I, are we have, have you been able to put together the comparison now that some folks gave raises, some didn't. It'd probably be good for this month, at least the FMP, to have next month maybe be updated sure. um, salary comparison, just to make sure we're staying. Did we right. lose ground, or we did we stay stay kind of where we were with in relation to everybody else? Or? Right. Yeah, we we can look at that. We haven't you know really reached out to try to figure out where we're at in the region, um, but we could definitely put that together. I guess I'd also want to know: is there anything we can do politically to try to clear the state log jam? We need yeah, to, that's a double what it have people pushing I, our. I, I'm sure any pressure that could be, you know, or at least a voice um, through our, you know, representatives at the legislation, you know, to express we need to, to move forward on this. I know through the, uh, um, I'm sure I know the Sheriff's Association, I know the Virginia Association for uh, Regional Jail Superintendents, you know, they've been expressing those concerns, um, you know. I, whether there's any traction being made, I, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, I certainly, as chair of the full authority, I'll reach out in the next week before I'm out of here. Are and have that conversation. Just our jurisdictions, or yes. this? So they're none of the outside. Those no. are all short. Okay. No. Uh, which is a pretty there, good percentage. I know. <laughs> you know, there, there, there's a couple ways to look at that. You know, if we could get rid of ours but keep their out of compliance, that's good because you know we're going to continue to make that revenue plus the additional. Uh, dollars you get from the state for those. So, um, but yeah, if we could definitely get rid of ours, it would be helpful. We amended the cold pepper contract shortly after COVID hit to not guarantee a certain number of beds just for this very reason. So right. that was wise on your part. Yeah, both, both jurisdictions, um, the rate did increase. So as of July 1, um, both contracts are paying that $37 a day um, versus 33, which is where they were at. But both still need beds. Um, Page County is actually utilizing another facility in the state. Um, they've got more people there than what they have here. Where are they going? Uh, Southside Regional, which is not what they want to do because it's a lot farther away. Um, but that's where it was available. Um, from what I understand, they have at least 60 there. Where is that? Emporia, I believe. Uh, Green, Greensville County? I yeah, think. I think it's Emporia. Wow. So, okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a good ways down there. But, uh, you know, they want to continue to use us because logistically it's much easier. It's just, you know, their numbers are where they're at and uh, we weren't taking people there for a while. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, we'll just have to wait to see. Uh, facility grounds and maintenance, um, we're currently seeking quotes um, due for some sidewalk repair that we have there at the facility. There's some uh, sidewalks that have heaved and cracked that just, you know, they're becoming safety problems. So um, we've got some names of some contractors, but, you know, anybody that's interested, well, I've got this, the public here, if they're interested in, you know, submitting a quote for, for some of that work, we'd be greatly appreciated for that. Uh, MA programs and services, um, our workforce teams, as you probably have seen, are back out working in the community, cutting grass, doing painting projects, cutting shrubs. Um, there's several pictures that we've got every jurisdiction you know we're trying to get as many um, days to you as we can um, we're actually running typically two teams if possible um, just to try to you know kind of catch back up where we were um, which we're almost there but there's just a lot of requests right now um, that you know we try to make sure we're meeting those needs for everybody you know doing some painting at the sheriff's office for Appahannock and, and uh, different projects you know weeding landscaping Shenandoah County and um, We've done some litter pickup here in, in uh, Warren as well, so you know we're. Are just, you feeling any pressure to 
have your work release program open again? We have not. We have not. Um, and that's just not something right now that is even in our minds to do. I mean, because there's just no way to control who they're coming in contact with and things like that. And it's just not uh, worth the, the risk of bringing you know, potential cases back in the facility at this time. You know, with the workforce, you know, they're not really having public interaction. You know, they're, they're you know, outside working, it's that same group, so we don't run that risk of them coming in contact with potential COVID-19. So the release was food production, which has been challenged with COVID. Also, we did, uh, we put out a press release, uh, we started our iWeb visitation system, which is, does, you know, is allowing the public to have visits with their friends and family um, versus having to come to the facility and conduct their visits through our previous system. They can actually, you know, sit at home through their smartphone or tablet or computer and, and link into the facility and, and have those um, visitation time. It seems to be going really well. Um, the ones that I've seen, you know, the family members and the inmates really like it. You know, they're able to kind of show some, you know, be able to uh, show them, you know, like a family pet or, you know, hey, this is what the garden looks like. So it's, you know, it's really kind of, you know, been good on both sides um, of the fence. And, you know, with not having visits since March, you know, it was kind of creating some tensions inside. So um, it's really been a blessing to have that system in place now. Um, we were kind of curious if, you know, how it was going to be received because it is a cost to the family. Um, it's minimal. I think it's $4 for 15 minutes, which if you look at buying, you know, a couple gallons of gas to drive to the facility and back home, it's really the same kind of money. Plus you have the convenience of not having to wait at the facility for your visit and things like that. And we've heard no complaints yet of the cost or the system or anything like that. We've had a few technical problems as far as camera images. And the biggest thing for the system to really work well is that whoever's on the outside needs to make sure they have a good, um, internet signal or cell signal um, for the but the, the visits you know the really high quality of the sound the picture and everything so um, explain how it works on the inmate side so there's on the inmate side they're, they're still sitting um, at the kiosk that we had previously so they're sitting in a private you know, either room or a private you know alcove off the, the housing area um, so they actually just retrofitted the old system into the cabinets of, or into the old air. Retrofitted the new system into the old cabinets, excuse me. Um, so that, you know, it's, it, it looks the same as what it did before. It's just, you know, the internals are different. So, um, you know, they're not able to sit in their cell with their tablet and conduct visits. Um, I'm sure that'll come at some point down the road, but uh, there's just some challenges with doing that. Um, our staff and Iowa visit staff have been very um, aggressive as far as making sure that people are following the rules because obviously you know, people want to do nefarious things or you know not dress appropriately or things like that you know and all the same rules and regulations apply as, as if they were there at the facility so you're able to actually send a message which goes shows up on their screen you know if people are driving down the road trying to conduct a visit they immediately get a message of you need to pull over or we'll see stop the visit. Uh, any violations have happened up to this point um, on the MA side, if it's their fault and they didn't tell their their visitor to stop, they will lose their visit for 30 days. County. Second violation is 60 days. Third violation, it's 90 days. So there's there's a, a real motivation for them to tell their visitor, please follow the rules, do the right thing. So, um, so far, so good as far as problems like that. Um, COVID-19 update, we are still something free. We have no suspected, no cases, or anything like that. So hopefully that continues down that path. And that's all I have. Thank you. Any additional questions for Russ? All right, financial report, Stephanie. Just over $466,000 was received from the compensation board in June for the May 2020 salaries and benefits reimbursement of which just over 110,000 was for vacancy savings for May and June. Um, contract bed rental billing for June was just under 60,000 for Culpepper and just under 40,000 for Page. Excuse me. The total bed rental revenue for FY20, and I have an updated number here, that includes revenue from medical, housing, commissary, and telephone fees 
is $2,074,080.95. That's with all the statistics and everything completed for FY20. June marks 100% of the year. Expenditures are at 90.15% used and revenue is at 95.72% realized. There are some expenditures and revenues that will be received post year, so these percentages do not reflect the final amounts of the year. And then also to note, Russ and I have had this discussion, that as you can see in the attached revenue report, the reported revenue for FY20 appears lower than it actually is due to the credits to the localities from FY19. Yeah. This issue appears every year. It's just an optics issue. Um, it just looks like there's less revenue, but there's not. So I'm currently working to find a way to resolve this reporting issue in the future so that it, these reports will more accurately represent what our true revenue numbers yeah, are. I mean, the, 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 the cleanest, <laughs> cleanest way to do it would be rather than do a credit, you send a check to the county and we pay you, we pass money back and forth. Right. But, um, looking at the, uh, the bed that we have rented right now at the $37 a day, that's a little over $1.2 million in your projected out for this year. We budgeted 980, so that's good, particularly if we see it picking up. So that was, that's obviously a worrisome spot for us in the budget and hopefully we- Well, I think it was wise set, well, you guys to suggest not, not budgeting 100%. That was, that's proving to be a, a good move from a budgetary perspective. And you've also going to have, unfortunately, greater vacancy savings than yeah, we really hope point. Just hopefully that situation improves, or right now, you know, you're, you're going to you're going to save some cash on that side. Of yeah, it. we may, and as we work through the year, we may need to think about signing bonuses or something like that as we as we have those uh, vacancy savings. Or even accrued. retention bonuses, right? I mean, that's or retention. Yeah, I, don't know. I would go. I, I don't know if I would go there first, but um, well, I just think because you lost nine, yeah. that those are types of things that. You know. Fortunately, uh, we we are you know going to have to you know have some mandatory overtime. We have an academy session starting August third. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so at that point, we will have I think nine officers going to the academy. With that, um, it will cause us to probably have one mandatory overtime position per shift um, because of vacancies. There may be two, depending upon if people are on leave or in the class or whatever. But that's typical. I mean, we typically have at least two mandatory overtime positions when there's academy session in. So we're not really operating any differently than what we did prior to our vacancies this time or prior to COVID-19. It's, it's typical. Um, like I said, the biggest thing is saving us is not operating that work release facility like we did, having to have you know, at least two officers over there shift and doing job checks and checking people in and out. And, you know, that, that's what's really helping us at this time. came up last year so I'm clear the, the overtime isn't any greater burden on the employees than, than what, where we were this time last year which say proportionally the inmate population has fallen as the correct as the workforce has fallen okay all right is that it Stephanie? Um, the only other thing I have is that Mary Earhart and her team plan to continue the accounting review of FY20 on August 6th and then the audit with RFC has been scheduled to occur the last week of September. I don't have a specific date yet, but it's sometime within that last week, September. Okay. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. All right, Doug, you had the yeah, transit. So, and I emailed this out today. We just sent out letters. Ross, I don't know if you officially received your letter or not, but it's in the mail as far as the, the corridor connector uh, possible contribution. So, um, in 2017, uh, the county worked with uh, the Nolan Shenandoah Valley Regional Commission uh, to work with uh, Virginia Regional Transit, who operates the Town of Front Royals uh, bus in town, to do a leg uh, outside of town limits. And uh, one of the main reasons had been the complaints that we received at RSW um, from folks that you know would get released and were going to work and they'd be walking up and down 522 uh, sometimes in the middle of the median sometimes at night sometimes in really poor weather we had at least one accident that well I wouldn't necessarily say it was directly caused but the person was walking on the edge and somebody swerved and got hit into a truck um, so the answer we came up with was to look at um, 
providing kind of a regular scheduled bus service that could serve uh, as early as our folks going out to work release. Um, and uh, we, the county has been budgeting 25,000 a year. Um, RSW has been making a $20,000 contribution. And then we've had a number of other folks, including the Warren County Public School System, um, Valley Health, and others that have contributed to help pick up the local portion. The local portion of the budget is 58906 The total cost is $184,080. Uh, there's 50% federal funding, 18% uh, state funding. So it's really been a kind of public park private partnership between the county, the jail, and other business partners in the corridor. Um, as you can see, part of its work release and part of the schools, because the kids that are going to the governor's school, uh, they get picked up in the morning from Warren County and Skyline, they get taken to LFCC. So we have the LFCC connection as well. I think we were the only jurisdiction that had a kind of a regular route going to LFCC on a regular basis. But uh, the reason why on the chart, um, the numbers are down for April, May, and June is COVID-19. And that's a combo of the Gulf School kids not riding, and that's a combination of, and the Our work release program being out. It also provides uh, rides for people that um, want to come visit at the jail. You have to, again, work within the parameters and the hours, but in theory that folks wanting to get to the jail. Um, we used to get a lot of complaints of people walking across to places like the auto care clinic and trying to use the telephone. They still do, but we, at least we can say we have an alternative. Um, the problem that we had seen you know, you can call a cab service, it's 10 bucks each way. And they, if you picked up two or three inmates, they were charging each inmate 10 bucks to go to a job that was paying minimum wage and you might work three hours washing dishes, you barely make enough money to pay for your ride to and from jail. So because these, these are inmate fees that we're using to do the, uh, the, the, the contribution that we have is not coming out of our, our general budget. It's not tax dollars. It's money that's generated through the commissary account, you know, that is to be used to go back for the inmates' benefit. So, um, you know, this directly goes to their benefit, you know, it helps get them to and from work or helps them to have a ride to be released to get back to where they need to go. So they don't pay anything to right. ride the bus from the facility. Yeah. So, so if we've got somebody that's released last year, right? I mean, yep. the same, same exact. Okay. So if we've got somebody released, we don't have to worry about whether or not they have money that they can at least get a ride to Front Royal or one of the other stops where the, the trolley goes to um, at no cost to them. Yeah, ideally, in the long run, I know there's discussion in Shenandoah for some type of service. I don't know where that is. But if, if, at some point, if we can ever get to a point where there's a cross-connection point where you need <laughs> Winfred with Winchester and, and, and Shenandoah that people could get off one bus and transfer they can from this bus into the town system, but eventually they'd be able to transfer to get over. Uh, that would certainly uh, up the ante a little bit, but at least, and like for Rappahannock, at least they're getting a little bit closer, Gary, I guess for folks that, you know, they could ride and get up, go get something to eat and call, have somebody meet them in town for a pickup or something yeah. if they need to. But um, it's, it's worked out and hopefully we can continue uh, operations. So but, do you have a sense that your business partners are going to step up again? I, you know, we've made the ask, and, and everybody's been really good to work with. I, I assume so. Um, and it's particularly Valley Health has been supported um, of the requests. And, and frankly, with you know, the counties 25 and 20, and Valley Health, I think it says 50, we're almost, almost there. And we've actually, there were a couple years where we didn't quite spend the 25, but we put that in reserve so that if, if you came up short one year, you got some additional funds to draw back on. But it's... Uh, it, it wouldn't have worked unless we had the support of RSW and the businesses, but, um, you know, we appreciate the making it happen. So the ask is the same as last year, same source, commissary fund. So I don't have any objection to the same methodology. So if I made a motion to, that we recommend to the full authority board uh, to make the $20,000 contribution out of the commissary fund, for FY 2021. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. 
but if you repeat that, then approximately 29. <laughs> All right, any other outstanding issues for the benefit of our committee? Only that we're going to sort of miss Mr. Stanley going forward. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you for being such a good source of information. In your no, I, I think, you know, uh, a huge part of the success of the facility has been staff, in particular Russ, of getting us, you know, it, it is, it's interesting. This is a unique process. You're, you're starting a new unit of local government completely from start. And not many of us in our careers are involved in one of those. And, you know, so you go from no employees and ramp up and build and open a facility is a, it's a sniffing undertaking. And if it wasn't for the dedication of our staff, it would have been a lot more difficult. And um, it, uh, it's uh, been a unique experience and one that I, I count among my, you know, a treasure of the experience and, and we can go around the state opening regional jails now. there you go <laughs> you know and we're the last one so far and I, you know really there's not many localities left that aren't right. part of a regional jail and um, we started off with four localities and ended up with three and that was what we needed to get it done and um, you know I, it was it was tenuous there for a while whether or not we were going to be able to pull it off and that's, it was tenuous whether or not, you know, there was half a dozen trips that I had to make to Richmond to try to lobby for funding. There was a chance we weren't going to get the 50% state match funded. And that was right when they were going, they were changing to a 25% match. And I want to thank, you know, uh, Bill and Brenda and their help, but uh, we stayed on it and uh, were able to secure funding, which really kept the cost down for the localities and, and, and mm -hmm. the cost down for the, you know, 30 years that we're paying debt on the facility. But um, it's, a, it's a unique experience, one I, I really enjoyed uh, going through the process of, but again, uh, having great staff has made the whole thing a lot easier. So I, I appreciate you guys for everything you've done. Thank you, Doug. You, you know, been, yeah, I will say, you know, since I've been there since the beginning, um, Mr. Stanley has been, you know, always available 24 hours a day. There's many times, you know, he's had to call me late at night or I've had to call him to let him know something's going on. He's always been accessible. He's always been a good source of information, like you said, because he was here prior to the you know, planning and things like that. And uh, his guidance and, and everything has been, you know, essential to the success that we've had up to this point. So thank you for being Thanks. All right. Our next meeting, August 27th, 1 o'clock, unless for some reason we defer, but I'll see you all in late August. Well, actually, I'll see you again at 2 o'clock, but theoretically, <laughs> Okay, motion to adjourn? So, second. All right, we are adjourned.